Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. Sometimes we want to connect the output of our signal generator to two other things, like maybe a spectrum analyzer or a frequency counter and a radio antenna input. The problem that we're presented with is that the output of the signal generator has an impedance of 50 ohms, the input of the spectrum analyzer has 50 ohms, and the antenna input of the radio has 50 ohms. If we simply connect everything together with a T adapter like this one, then the signal generator is going to see 25 ohms across its output, and that's certainly not the ideal thing to do from any point of view. So, how do we fix this? Well, we use an RF power splitter. We've all seen these things on 75 ohm cable TV installations. The signal generator connects to one port, the spectrum analyzer to another, and the radio antennas connector to the third. Everyone is happy. In this video, I'm going to show you how to make one of these for yourself. I will be demonstrating with a three-port splitter, but what you learn here will enable you to build a splitter with any number of ports to fit your particular need. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Now, to begin with, let's take a look at the basic design. The object of an RF power splitter is twofold. First, it is to provide a given impedance at each port, assuming that the remaining ports are terminated with that same impedance. So, with a three port, 50 ohm power splitter, we are observing the impedance looking into port one, while ports two and three are terminated with 50 ohms. Now, as we're looking into port one, we will see 50 ohms impedance. The second is that the power input is split equally between each of the output ports. So in essence, the RF power splitter is nothing more than an impedance controlled voltage divider. As such, the basic design of a resistive RF power splitter is quite simple. It consists of a single series resistor connected to each port. The other end of these resistors are connected together as kind of a signal nexus, if you will. Analysis of this configuration can be accomplished with basic Ohm's laws that pertains to voltage dividers. Now, I'm not going to go through all the analysis here, but here is the end result for your convenience. Now, I put a link down in the description to a PDF which has all of these equations and definitions and everything defined for you. If we know the number of ports we want and the characteristic impedance we're shooting for, then the required series resistor is equal to this big quantity is the number of ports we want minus two on the top divided by the number of ports we want all times the characteristic impedance that we're shooting for. The power loss from the input port to the output port in dB is equal to 20 times the log to the base 10 of 1 divided by the number of ports that we're looking to design minus 1. And the output voltage given a known input voltage is equal to the voltage in divided by the number of ports minus 1. Now, if we also know the rated power dissipation of the series resistor, then the maximum power input to the splitter will be equal to the power dissipation of the resistor times the characteristic impedance of the system, all divided by 2 times the value of the series resistor. Now, what about my experiment? My goal was to create an RF power splitter with three ports one for the source, and one for each of the two possible loads. My target impedance was 50 ohms. So let's do the math for this project. The series resistor is going to be equal to the number of ports, which is 3, minus 2, all divided by the number of ports, and that quantity times that characteristic impedance, which ends up giving me one-third of 50, or five, 50 over 3, which is 16.66666666, lots of sixes, 
ohms. And I can expect the power loss from the input port to the output port to be 20 times the log of the quantity 1 over the number of ports minus 1, which gives me 20 times the log of 1 divided by 3 minus 1, or 20 times the log of 1 half, which I end up with minus 6.02 dB. Now that I know what I need and what to expect from this, let's do a quick experiment. I wanted to do a quick and dirty experiment just to see how this worked. So I started with a small enclosure that already had some BNC connectors on it. I went to my ancient resistor junk box that was filled with very old carbon composition resistors and selected six 33 ohm resistors. I would use two of these in parallel to create the needed 16.5 ohm resistors for the splitter. I didn't even shorten the leads. I just soldered them onto the connectors and then tested the hole to see how well it worked. As you can see, the SWR climbs rather sharply and then does a lot of weird and strange things. Well, none of this is terrifically surprising, at least considering the ugliness of the assembly. However, at the lowest frequencies, it is doing exactly what we want it to do. At 1 megahertz, it has an SWR of 1.04 to 1. And the SWR doesn't crest over 1.5 to 1 until we get to over 50 megahertz. Now, let's take a look at the through performance. Our goal is minus 6 dB. Now, at the same place that we crested over 1.5 to 1 SWR, the through is minus 6.4 dB, which is within 7% of our goal of minus 6 dB. But like the SWR, it starts to go totally nuts when you get too far past this point. Nonetheless, this experiment has done exactly what I wanted it to do. Proof of concept. So, the time has come to buy the right resistors and build a better one. So, I bought some 16.7 ohm 1% resistors and replaced the original ugly resistors with them. I put them in the same enclosure, but cutting the leads as short as I possibly could and still making connections inside the enclosure. Looking at the results, it's certainly way better than my mega ugly version. At 50 megahertz, the SWR is 1.12 to 1 as compared to version 1, which had an SWR of 1.48 to 1. It also doesn't do all that totally weird stuff as we go up in frequency. But if I want to use this when working near 500 megahertz, it still is majorly pathetic for its SWR. I mean, I'm looking at nearly a 3 to 1 SWR at 500 megahertz. Not only that, notice that little bump in the vicinity of 265 megahertz. Now, when we look at the through response, you'll understand why this is. In fact, let's just take a look at the through response. Now, it is way better than version 1. And at 50 megahertz, the through response is within 1% of our minus 6 dB target as compared to version 1's 7%. But it's still not nearly good enough. Notice the significant downward spike in the vicinity of 265 megahertz. This represents, I believe, a resonance where the capacitive reactants and the inductive reactants of this implementation are equal and produce a resonance, obviously not the ideal thing to have happen. At 500 megahertz, the through response is minus 6.5 dB, which is only within 8.3% of our nominal. So, what is the problem with this? Well. Look at these great big long leads here, all of the inductance and everything associated with these long leads. This has got to be the whole problem, thinks me. I will construct one where the leads are nearly zero long. So I created my own compact chassis of sorts, which allows me to shorten the resistor leads a lot more. 
I mean, look at this. There is no leads whatsoever here. Just the, the resistor connected directly to the connectors. This is as short as you can get those leads. Surely this is going to work perfectly. Yes, it worked a lot better, as we can see here with the SWR plot. The SWR at 500 megahertz is 2.1 to 1 as compared to version 2's nearly 3 to 1 SWR. And at 1 gigahertz it's 4 to 1, while version 2 was 6.5 to 1. But this is still not acceptable to me. Now while we saw significant improvement over version 2 in the SWR performance, the through performance is not significantly better except that we've eliminated the downward spike at around 265 megahertz. By shortening the leads, I reduced the inductance enough so that the resonance was probably moved up beyond the limits of our scan. So what can I do now to improve the performance? Well, the only answer is to eliminate the leads altogether, which means surface mount devices and impedance matched PCB traces. Uh, ouch, how do you do that? Well, it's not anywhere near as difficult as one might think, thanks to the bountiful existence of online calculators. If you want to dive into this, then I encourage you to watch my video on impedance controlled PCB features. There you will discover that you, yes, you can do this. I've put a link to this video up in the corner for you. So what does this look like? I created a one and a half inch by one and a half inch or 3.05 centimeter by 3.05 centimeter PCB which has a place for three edge-mounted BNC connectors and three 1210 package surface mount resistors. The traces running from the connectors to the resistors are impedance-controlled traces with a 50-ohm impedance. I decided to have OSH Park fabricate my PCBs, so I procured the material specifications from their website. I then used the methods that I talked about in my video on impedance controlled PCB features to arrive at the final trace widths and spacing. If you're interested in creating one of these for yourself, I've provided a zip file for you which has the entire design including the Gerber files, the drill file, and the bill of materials. See the link down in the description to download this zip file. Now, do note that this design assumes the material specifications that are provided by OSH Park. If you choose a different fabrication house, your specifications might be different. Now, one clever ploy that folks use to reduce the inductance associated with a resistor is to put resistors in parallel. The inductance of the overall assembly is significantly lower than a single resistor on its own. So I decided to use three resistors in parallel, each soldered right on top of the other to create my series resistor. Now each of these resistors would be 50 ohms. Now comes the search. You know, you'd be surprised. A 50 ohm resistor is not quite as common as you might think, but 49.9 ohms is. So I chose to use three 49.9 ohm resistors in parallel. Okay, so what tolerance do I want on those? The easiest to procure is 1%. Then I wondered, well, what might be the worst case result if I used 1% resistors? Well, I won't go through all the math here, but I'll show you the results. I assume that two ports are terminated with perfect 50 ohm loads, and I calculated the resulting SWR looking into the remaining port, I assumed two different scenarios. The first is that all of the 49.9 ohm resistor values are as low as possible within their tolerance. The second is that they're all as high as possible within their tolerance. What was the resulting SWRs? Well, with them all at their lowest value, I got an SWR of 1.006 to 1. With their values all at their highest level, I got an SWR of 1.004 to 1. 
Okay. Decision made, 49.9 ohm, 1% it is. The last question is, what is the maximum power I can drive into this? Now the resistors that I specified are rated at 0.5 watts each for their power dissipation. The parallel combination of three of these gives us a total possible dissipation of 1.5 watts. So let's put this into our Evercool equation, which takes into consideration the proper dereading of the components so they actually don't actually see more than half of the rated capabilities. Maximum power dissipation is equal to the power dissipation of the resistors as specified, which is 1.5 watts, times the characteristic impedance of 50 ohms, all divided by 2 times the resistance of the series resistor, which is 16.666666 ohms, all comes out to be 1.5 times 3 divided by 2, or 2.25 watts. Wow, that's nice. Now, let's look at its performance. First, the SWR from 1 megahertz to 1 gigahertz as before. Now, in comparison to all of the other version, this is unbelievably great. But let's look at it all by itself. Still, look at this. It meets and exceeds all my expectations. The maximum SWR across the entire range from 1 megahertz to 1 gigahertz is only 1.135 to 1. But what about the through response? Again, in comparison to the all of the versions before, it is way awesome. Look at this through response by itself. It still looks wonderful to me. Okay, so it's not perfectly smooth, but it is significantly better than any of the previous versions. Across this whole range from one megahertz to one gigahertz, the through response is minus six dB, minus 2.2%, plus 5.55%, and this is very respectable, especially considering the experimental nature of the project. Now, while I've been evaluating all my attempts to 1 gigahertz, my end goal, as you probably figured out by now, has always been 500 megahertz. When I take a look at the data with this in mind, I see that the maximum SWR from 1 megahertz to 500 megahertz is 1.042 to 1. And the through response is minus 6 dB, minus 2.2% plus 1.45%. I cannot be possibly more pleased with these results. Now you've seen the entire process from beginning to end. You can see that you, yes, you can do this too. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.